and everything is gone. Phone, passport, wallet, camera. What am I actually gonna do? This is me sat on a bus at the Tunisian border, having absolutely no clue what's going on. I've just stepped off a 500 mile ferry from Europe to Africa, completely unaware that these last few miles trying to get from this moment here to my hotel room in the city are going to be such extremely hard work. Because this is the story of how I got everything stolen from me in Tunisia and what I learned from it, including three little pieces of advice so that you don't end up in the same mess as me. I have already deliberately posted some other things from my solo trip around Tunisia that came later on where I had a good time before sharing this story. Just because I didn't want it to seem that I was going in on the entire country somehow and just so that the first thing you saw me share from there wasn't this entire nightmare. So if you have been following all of that before, this video is kind of posted out of chronology in terms of when it happened in the story. And look, this whole thing, I get it, I'm really lucky to be able to travel as much as I do and sometimes bad things happen. I am aware that this is the kind of scrape that you do get yourself into when you voluntarily go on weird trips like this and I am pretty sure that this all would have been much more straightforward and safe if I had just flown to the Tunis Carthage airport like a normal person. I am aware of all of that so just forgive me for very seriously complaining for the rest of the video. It was just... <sighs> on a knife edge, like based on the smallest margins, could have gone completely fine or absolutely to hell. When my ferry from Italy to Tunisia was coming into the harbour, I did kind of wonder where I should go to go through immigration on foot. I mean, everyone else was just driving off. And I was kind of pointed towards this bus and then I went up to the driver there and he kind of waved me on. He like beckoned me through without saying anything and I sat there for a while kind of confused until to my absolute delight, three other people got on. So at least it wasn't just me on there anymore. And we left and we drove around the harbor for a while going through some kind of checkpoints. Like I literally have no idea what's going on, but whatever, I'm willing to go with it. Probably my passport gets stamped at the end of this somehow. And then eventually the driver stops next to this nondescript looking building with a fire escape on the outside and kind of gestures for us to go up it. And I climbed the stairs of this fire escape thinking, where am I? Like what's going on? But thankfully I went through a door at the top and I did enter into a big like air port style immigration. So, so far on the right track, I have made a little bit of progress along this line. So us few people who've got off the bus come into this immigration place and for some reason there's already a huge queue ahead of us. I also noticed pretty much straight away that I'm like the only foreigner. It seems like most other people are locals returning home from a trip. And I joined the back of the queue thinking, ah, oh, everything's fine. I am in the right place. I can relax now. Well, no, not so much. <laughs> Suddenly this guy comes up to me and I say guy, he was an absolute mountain of a human. Like he could have been a rugby player and then on top of that he had all like, you know, the bulletproof, the police stuff, the guns, belt full of stuff. Like he was just huge and <laughs> even from the way I'm describing all of this stuff, you can tell this is like such a core stress memory for me. And he starts talking to me in French. For those of you who don't know, Tunisia used to be a French colony. So while all of the locals generally speak Arabic to each other today, French is a very popular second language and often as a tourist you'll be addressed in French just because they look at me and assume that I can't speak Arabic which I mean like yeah fair enough although I don't speak either language it is kind of true like I did do French in middle school obviously French phonetics is much more similar to English we have a lot of loan words blah 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 like if there's one thing I'm going to be able to do out of the two it is going to be French but this guy has just completely taken me off guard by shouting all of this stuff at me in French and I have no idea what's going on but looking up at him like you know the small child that I am compared to this guy. I'm like, okay, well, I have my passport in my hand. Maybe it would help if I just give that to him. And yeah, he does seem kind of happy to take my passport off me. <laughs> and before I go any further with the story, I'd just like to take a moment to thank the sponsor of today's video, which is Incogni. I've been a user of Incogni for over a year now, and the amount of work that they've done on my behalf in that time is actually kind of astounding. If you haven't heard of it before, Incogni is a platform that gets your sensitive personal information removed from databases where it really shouldn't have been in the first place. Unfortunately, the internet is full of data brokers and people search sites that create these huge extensive profiles of all of us for purposes ranging from marketing and excessive spam all the way through to fraud and identity theft. And it's not just their intent to resell and misuse your data that makes them dangerous, 
It's actually what happens and who gains access to your data when they have a breach and everybody's personal information gets leaked at once. Now, these databases are all over, but the good news is that Incogni has the expertise and the lawyers required to file legal data removal requests on your behalf and get you wiped from their records forever. And I can actually say from personal experience that it's really cool watching the notifications come back, like what have they removed me from now? Oh, another scam site that was hoarding everyone's data. Awesome. If you want that feeling too, you can use the link in the description or use the code Thornton for 60% off of your subscription to Incogni. And thanks to their 30 day money back guarantee, there's no risk in just trying it out. So thanks again to Incogni for sponsoring this video. And let's get back to... Uh... Let's get back to the story, this entire mess that I found myself in. So I'm stood there alone at the Tunisian border with the 21st century police version of the mountain from Game of Thrones, flicking through my passport and examining all of the stamps in there. And when he's bored with going through all of those, he starts to give me the full immigration interview. Stood up at the back of the queue, just to me. Where are you from? What job do you do? Why are you here? Are you with a tour group? How long are you staying here? What hotels are you staying in? Do you know anyone in this country? How long until you leave Tunisia again? Where are you going next after this and why? And yeah, thankfully I've been through enough borders right now that I kind of know what questions to anticipate, so I was kind of stumbling through the language barrier. I had some of my bookings and so on screenshotted on my phone so that I did have some proof to show him. And I felt like I was kind of doing okay at this particular test, but I couldn't get over this question of like, why me? There's loads of people ahead of me in the queue. Why am I being singled out for different treatment? Like, what have I done wrong? And I was just thinking, oh, I definitely shouldn't be here. Like, this is, this is just a bad idea. How have I got myself into this situation? But I will say that it is funny how when you most need it, when you're most worried about something, your brain can defrost some of that middle school French. And eventually he'd had enough of listening to my mediocre French answers and he beckoned me to follow him. And he walked right up to the front of the queue, up to the passport control booth, went around the back and goes inside and starts talking to the actual officer in there who's stamping people's passports. And I notice him pointing at me through the glass and he starts to translate all of my answers to the immigration questions to this guy, he tells them all of my details in Arabic. And then he walks back out of the booth, comes back around to me and taps me on the shoulder with all the force that you would expect a man of his size gives taps on the shoulder. And he just looks at me and he's like, welcome to Tunisia. And then he disappears into the mist from where he came. And the guy in the booth takes like 0.5 seconds to stamp my passport and waves me right through. So the entire time I thought that me being singled out was I've done something wrong and I'm not welcome, but he was just fast tracking me. Probably he was the one on the staff who spoke the best French and whenever they do see someone who's very visibly foreign and probably doesn't speak Arabic, he's like, oh, let me go and use my French on him and I'll translate it into Arabic for the other officers. And then while he was talking to me, he was like, oh, let me just queue jump this guy, give him a good impression of our country on his first day here, stuff like that. Like it was just a very good, very welcoming customer service experience for the entire time. I just, I didn't know what was going on, which kind of actually ended up playing the pattern for a lot of my interactions in that country that I would say were like chaotic but sound and I don't know if sound is maybe a Britishism but it basically means like well-meaning and trustworthy and what I learned from all of that is to relax even if you're intimidated people generally have your back but all of this strife has only got me this far on the line that represents the last few miles to my hotel room. Having spent last night on a ferry, you'll understand that my nice clean room and soft pillow and in general a bed that isn't like swinging around with the sea were really calling to me right now, but I still wasn't even through the border. So I've gone through passport control, kind of on the edge, but I walk up to security thinking, oh, that was a good thing. I am in the right place, everything's fine now, and I can definitely relax. Well, also no. <laughs> If you've seen any of my other videos, then by now you'll probably know that I travel with only hand luggage. Generally one backpack like this, this is my 30 litre from Salomon, and one smaller bag like this, tote bag. This is actually my go-to. This has been to almost every continent in the world with me. For some reason, I always choose it. I don't know why. And until now, I've always gone with the exact same setup. In the backpack, I just put non-valuable things, clothes, toiletries, sometimes my tripod, but nothing like super expensive or irreplaceable. And that enables me to basically not care about it being out of my sight. I'll put it anywhere in any of the lockers up and down the plane, or I'll put it above my head on the train or on the train. Like if there's more space in a luggage storage rack in another carriage, then I'll put it there out of my sight because 
If it does get stolen, it's not ideal, but also like have fun stealing my dirty laundry and like half a tube of toothpaste, I would totally survive losing it. And like if one of those annoying airlines says there's no overhead locker space, you have to check something in, then I would just give them the backpack like without a second thought. But this smaller bag, <laughs> you can see where this is going. It's the opposite. I always keep it next to me or by my feet, somewhere that is always within reach because it has important things, my camera or my SD cards, passport, power bank, or just things that I would want to have on me during the journey, like a bottle of water or something, bottle of water. So keep that split in mind as I try to describe the security checkpoint at Tunis, which I wish I had footage of. Obviously you're not allowed to film in these places, but it's just a single track conveyor belt, luggage, security, x-ray machine. And then next to it, the classic walkthrough metal detector arch. The baggage scanner has no trays, but like I've seen this before, you just have to put your bags straight on the belt and any loose things have to go in one of the bags because there's no trays. I put my small bag onto the belt first and then my backpack. But because the smaller one is a tote bag, it's kind of half open at the top and I need to empty my pockets before going through the metal detector, I just stuff everything in there. So now it also has my phone, headphones and wallet and house keys in there. So combine that with my camera, SD cards and passport, literally everything is in there. <laughs> everything. And so I leave my bags on the belt, I turn to the side to go through the metal detector, but they're not ready for me for some reason, they're doing something on like the computer with the settings of the metal detector, and then even when they do call me through, I have to go through twice for some reason, even though I definitely don't think I set it off. It was all kind of weird, but like I've already worried about enough pointless stuff at this point, I'm just going along with anything, and in the end I do get through. I make it through the metal detector, turn back around again to stand by the belt on the other side where the bag should be coming out, just totally chill, waiting for my stuff to reappear. And then pretty soon my backpack does come out, and great, I reach down, put it on my back, everything's fine, just waiting for the tote bag to come out now. And then, yeah, it hits me. The tote bag went in first, my backpack went in second. The first bag is gone. I'm stood here all alone with a bag of laundry on my back, and everything is gone. Phone, passport, wallet, camera, what am I gonna do? It isn't the kind of machine where there's two tracks and they can bring it over to inspect it. It was literally just one belt in and out and the lady working there hasn't grabbed it. She's the only one and she's just sat there looking at the screen. And then however long this particular panic lasted, it felt like ages in my head. Like I've absolutely had it, right? No phone, no passport, no money. If I can't fix this, what am I actually going to do? And I try to snap myself back into reality and look around to see just completely panicked where my bag could have run off to. This immigration area is a huge space with only one exit on the other side, kind of like a nothing to declare situation, but not like a long tunnel or a corridor. You just go through and then you turn a corner and you're outside in the car park. And I just about see right before that exit, someone pushing a trolley with some suitcases on it. I remember it so clearly, they're like three across the bottom, one on each side, and then in the middle, from the angle where I'm seeing it from behind, I can just see, drooping over between the two suitcases on the top layer, the blue handles of my tote bag, just swinging along as he's pushing this trolley. And I freak out, <laughs> like people who know me in real life will know I'd do anything to avoid a scene, but like at that point my fight or flight was just going absolutely crazy. This was proper <laughs> last minute life or death stuff for me, how I felt in that moment. And even now recounting all of this, like I can tell it's, yeah, it's a very anxious memory for me. I just spotted him and I instinctively just start shouting, no! No! And I run over and while running across immigration looking like an idiot, I'm just shouting, no! No! And he doesn't stop, obviously he's not listening for English weirdos shouting and running, like he's not paying attention. But I do catch up to him, I just disregard all of his suitcase or any, any you know, of his priorities, of his luggage. And I yank the handle of this bag off of his trolley. And I just remember grabbing it and like clutching it to my chest like it's a baby or something. And I'm just looking at this guy going, it's mine. Mine. It's mine. It belongs to me. Again in English, as if I'm helping anything. And he starts talking back to me in Arabic, and obviously we can't understand each other at all. And it just creates this whole thing where, oh, honestly, I'd love to see, like, like I said, you can't film in there, obviously it's security, but 
I would give anything to have the CCTV footage of this whole for all. It's, it must be so funny. It is, like I said, still a really stress inducing memory for me, but when I retell it to people in real life, it does generally get a laugh. So like, feel free. I'm very happy if you use this to like laugh at my expense. And uh, if you do laugh at my expense, feel free to give the video a subscribe just so I get something out of all of this. <laughs> And yeah, because of all this commotion, three police come over, also in all of their gear with their guns and stuff, and they start talking to this guy who was pushing the trolley. And it's only at that moment, watching them talking to him, but staring at me, that I realise that from my point of view, I've just had my bag stolen. But from their point of view, wherever they were stationed watching this whole scene, I've just run over to this guy and stolen from him. To them, I'm the thief. But like I said, I am just clinging on to this for dear life. I'm not letting go of it for anybody. I've just run through the entire scenario in my head. Passportless, phoneless, moneyless, walking out onto the streets of Tunisia by myself. And now that this is all in my hands again, although I haven't even looked inside it to check that everything's still there yet, I am not letting it out of my grip again. And they're all discussing and I'm just going, it's mine. It belongs to me. <laughs> oh God. Honestly, just so embarrassing, but like the adrenaline was really adrenalining at this point. So I'm just gripping onto the bag, yeah, like it's a baby or something, talking in English to people even though they can't understand me. And at this point, the guy who was pushing the trolley calls over two other people, not two more police, just other passengers. And he's speaking to them and he gestures to the luggage that's still on the trolley and then he gestures to me and the bag and they basically just shake their head at him and then walk off without really saying much. And I'm like, okay. And then he goes and talks to these three police again and they seem kind of satisfied suddenly and they walk away again. And I'm just freaking out as if this whole melee is still going on. But he walks up to me very calmly and puts one hand on my shoulder. Bloody hell, there's a lot of people touching my shoulder in this story. <laughs> I don't know why. And he said something to me very quietly in what I guess was Arabic. And then he leaves me with my bag and goes back to pushing his trolley out. And yeah, I mean, this isn't even the only or, or the last strife that I'm gonna face this evening. But at that point, I was willing to come back down. I feel like I've received a genuine apology. My interpretation is that he was like a taxi driver or a porter or something working for these two other people who he beckoned over. And when they came through the metal detector, they had just said to him like, oh yeah, everything that's coming out of the scanner right now is ours, just take it to the car for us. And then because I was a bit delayed coming through the metal detector and no one else was there to claim my tote bag when it came out, he just got a bit overzealous with their definition of everything coming out is ours. That's like the most charitable interpretation that I can possibly give and I'm really trying to stick to it. I do get it, genuine dumb mistakes like this do happen. It's just that that particular mistake would have been so horrendous for me. Such a complete definition of an on a knife edge situation, like the balance and the margin between everything's fine and complete disaster was just the fact that I turned my neck and saw him before he got round the corner and loaded my bags into the boot of a car and disappeared forever. Literally game over, like I, I honestly don't know what I would have done. And looking back now and when I've told this story to people, I do know that worst case scenario, you find the British Embassy in Tunis, somehow they're going to be able to repatriate you at some point eventually and I just lose the money I've spent on the trip, I lose the money rebuying everything I've lost, getting new passport cards, whatever, but like I survive, everything's fine. Losing the footage I'd shot on the trip up to then, probably would have been the worst thing. But also, as we'll see in a second, me trying to get a taxi to my hotel, like no money, no ability to speak the language, like it's gonna be hard enough getting anywhere. Is there even a British embassy in Tunis? Like if there is, I don't know where it is or how I would have got there. And what I learned from that is to never put all your eggs in one basket. In the future, I'll always make sure in every piece of luggage that I carry, there's something, some old UK ID that I don't even use anymore, some credit card that I never use, but like would work if I had to use it, and crucially, some paper US dollars. As you can probably hear from me talking about this, the amount of stress chemicals being released in my brain per millimeter advanced on this line was at an all time bad ratio at this point. And I still wasn't safe and out of the woods yet because speaking of US dollars, by the time I stepped outside into the car park, just completely done with everything and wanting to go to my hotel room and scream into that nice clean pillow that was waiting for me, I hit the next problem, 
getting a taxi. Tunisian dinars are actually a closed currency, which means that you're not allowed to take them out of the country and you're not allowed to buy them outside of the country and bring them with you. So it's actually impossible or at least illegal to arrive with Tunisian cash on you. I had read online that there was an ATM working at the ferry port, but on the ground that night by myself, that definitely did not seem to be the case. Outside, people are coming up to me offering a taxi and I'm just like, yeah, no dinars. <laughs> the dinar, thinking, oh man, what am I gonna do? Like I try Uber on my phone, nothing. I try Bolt because I remember specifically being told that that works in Tunis and yes, it does work, but no card payment. You have to pay in cash at the end of the ride, which I didn't have. And the longer I stand there by myself, again thinking, oh, should I have done this? Why am I here? How am I gonna fix this? Eventually a couple of taxi drivers are trying to help me out. They like notice the situation and they say something like, no dinars, pay dollars which is really nice of them and such a famous scenario. Like everybody who travels a lot knows that around the world, US dollars get you out of situations. It's kind of a standard thing. And yet I had recently been in the US and totally neglected to bring back any paper money with me. I even offered these guys euros and they're just like, oh, no, dollars. <laughs> ah, <laughs> why is it so hard? <laughs> So I was kind of stuck until I just started going down the line of taxi drivers knocking on windows and seeing if I could find one who had like this much English and then I added it to my this much French and we kind of met in the middle and arranged that he would drive me to the hotel stopping at a currency exchange place on the way. I would change some euros for dinars he would take me the rest of the way to the hotel and I would give him a big tip at the end in dinars. And it was kind of a chaotic drive, like I was excited to be on my way, moving along the line again and getting my first kind of glimpses of pitch black nighttime Tunis, like classic arrival in a new city stuff, but also like I was sat in the back with no seatbelt and he was very clearly disregarding the importance of slowing down before you go over a speed bump. And at one point, some third guy gets in the passenger seat. <laughs> and on any other day, I'd have been like, oh, what is going on? Like, is this normal in this country? But at this point, I was totally willing to go along with absolutely anything that progressed me along this line. And by now you'll understand just how relieved I was to eventually make it to my hotel room and go to sleep. It was so good. And what I learned from that situation is don't leave home without US dollars ever, ever again. And like I said, it is just a dumb anecdote now. The kind of annoying stuff that happens when you travel. You get yourself into it, like it's fine. I'm very happy if you want to laugh at my expense over how over panicked I was. That's kind of half the reason I wanted to share this story. I guess you go to enough countries and you eventually end up getting into some kind of scrapes. Like it's it's not a big deal. Oh, I just wish, yeah, I just wish I had the CCTV footage of those like three police and me and this guy. And I'm just like, mine, it's mine. <laughs> God, what a mess. <laughs> I had my stuff very briefly and possibly accidentally stolen from me, but I was so close to having it permanently stolen from me and I still genuinely don't know what I would have done had that come to pass. I wouldn't have any footage of my nice memories of the rest of the time I spent in Tunisia, that's for sure. Like the day I spent touring Tunis and Carthage and learning about the history and eating the local food, which you can click here to watch next. And thank you so much for watching. Subscribe if you're new around here, try out Incogni at the link in the description to take back control of your personal data, and I'll see you next time.